Hi, morning everyone. Sorry about that. We had a few IT issues which we now have got resolved. So um, welcome, welcome. My name's Rob Bartlett. I'm the director of the British Valve and Actuator Association uh, based in Banbury here in uh, Oxfordshire in the UK. I noticed that we've got lots of uh, viewers today. Uh, in fact, from all over the world, it would appear. We've got Italy, Mexico, India, the Middle East are all represented. Uh, some old friends, some new friends, members, non-members, and readers of the magazine. So all are welcome. Do say hi in the chat if you're out there. Just let us know we've got an audience still after our little issue. Um, but it's really good to see you all, and thank you for coming. Um, BVAA, what's BVAA? Well, we're the trade association here in the UK that looks after the British valve industry. Uh, we've been going about 80 years, and we do all sorts of things, technical and commercial stuff. Um, but one of the things that we're, we're really well known for is our training. Um, and the idea today is that we give you a brief introduction uh, to what is our introduction to valves course. It's a taster session, so it's representative of the material that we do in the full course. Uh, and we will be running that full course online uh, now. We usually do it here at our headquarters upstairs in the training suite. But we've decided that we need to take this online. Uh, and this obviously has opened up the world to us, so this is great. So COVID-19, thank you for that. You've really acted as a catalyst to get that going. Um, this is the second of two taster sessions. We held one yesterday. Um, Peter Dix is our technical consultant here, principal te technical consultant. He leads a team, actually. Uh, and Peter's going to take you through this short session. We think it will be about 20, 25 minutes or so. Uh, we've left plenty of time for Q&A. So if you've got any questions, do, do drop them into the chat if you wouldn't mind. And what I'll do is I'll fish those out for Peter who will be concentrating on the presentation. And um, it, if we don't have enough time to resolve them, we can always resort to email and such like later on. Um, as I say, the, this, will, this is a taster for the full course. We're going to run that over four dates coming up shortly on the 29th of September. And then there'll be three further sessions on the 1st, 6th and 8th of October. They're about an hour and a half each with plenty of time to, again, for a Q and A. So um, we've got information about the full course that we'll tell you all about at the end. Um, but the great thing about doing this course online, of course, is it's a whole lot easier to participate and it's way cheaper than coming to the offices here, uh, which is a little bit awkward at the moment, as everybody knows. So uh, with no further ado, Peter, I'm gonna hand over to yourself. Uh, take it away, sir. Thank you very much, Rob, and uh, good morning to everyone. Welcome to this uh, BVAA uh, Introduction to Valve uh, webinar taster session. Um, as you can see, the first slide on the screen, which uh, I think we'd intended you to see slightly earlier, so apologies for the um, technical issue we had, uh, is asking a question. The question is, when were the first valves used? Now, if anyone has any uh, ideas when the first valves were used or records of them uh, um, exist, then uh, please just uh, enter that in your chat box and uh, we will come um, in the next few slides to the answer to the question. So um, just as a bit of fun, get everyone warmed up. Um, if you'd like to guess um, the answer to the question, then uh, please go ahead and enter it in the chat. So um, obviously the BVAA have um, um, use the best endeavours to uh, ensure the accuracy of the information that you're going to see on these slides. But unfortunately, we can't accept any uh, responsibility for any errors or emissions. Um, the copyright of the material that you'll see is um, controlled by the BVAA. So uh, anyone that uh, wants to uh, reproduce it in any way um, needs to request our written consent in advance. As Rob has said, uh, my name is Peter Dix. Uh, I'm a chartered mechanical engineer, and uh, I'm presenting these slides to you today. And uh, I also um, uh, am running the, the uh, online training, which will start later on in the, the month, as, John, uh, as Rob has said. Um, I joined the valve industry as a development engineer uh, back in 1985 with IMI Bailey Burkett. And uh, I've worked in the industry pretty much ever since. Um, in roles such as uh, technical director and uh, a general manager level um, for a variety of customer uh, companies, as you can see on the slide. Um, during the, uh, those years, uh, I've experienced uh, the design and manufacture of pretty much 
every type of valve um, that we're going to talk about today. And uh, I'm currently working as a technical consultant to the UK valve industry. But uh, I also have a role as chairman of the BSI committee of PSE 18. PSE 18 now responsible for covering uh, the development of international standards to ISO and to uh, EN uh, publications for all industrial valves and actuators. So the core scope that we're going to uh, go through with you today is really going to look at the five basic valve types and they're classified by the movement of the valve and also the flow direction and we'll also spend a little bit of time looking at some common materials both metallic used in the pressure envelope and polymeric materials typically used in seats or valve packings. Now as you can see from the uh, pictures on this slide then uh, industrial valves are very uh, widely used in modern society. They're used in um, uh, the process industry and chemical industries. They're used in power generation and oil and gas exploration and downstream. Um, we make use of them in uh, pharmaceutical, food, beverage, uh, and also uh, in our um, marine and transportation industries. They also have an extremely important role in the um, supply and distribution of our drinking water and wastewater. In fact, it's true to say that industrial valves are used everywhere in modern society, and it's extremely difficult to think of a product or a commodity that you receive and make use of daily that doesn't have an industrial valve uh, involved somewhere in its uh, manufacture or distribution. But if we look back at the history of valves, and on this slide, you'll actually see the answer to the question we were asking earlier. Um, the first evidence and records of simple valves being used by man uh, is that they were used by Roman and Greek society in their buildings. So from around about 600 BC, we've seen evidence of valves being used. And uh, obviously that's the answer to the question. Uh, the picture that you can see on the slide is a bronze cock valve dating back to AD 25. And that was actually um, used by the Romans for uh, water supply. However, it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th century that the uh, development and widespread use of valves accelerated dramatically. This was because uh, firstly water and then latterly steam uh, were developed as uh, prime sources of energy to power the Industrial Revolution and valves were developed in order to control that power. Let's take a look at some basic definitions now. The first one is to answer the question, what is a valve? Well, a valve is defined as a device that regulates the flow of gases, liquids or loose materials. And it does this by obstructing ports or passageways. So basically, any device that is installed within a pipeline that varies the area available to flow or isolates the flow in a process can be considered to be a valve. And you'll see that covers quite a variety of uh, different devices as we go through the next few slides. But before we do that, then we also need to look at uh, another definition, and that is the definition of the word obturator. Now, an obturator, or the word obturator is not used regularly in the English language, um, but it has been adopted by the international valve community um, to describe a closure component. So um, something like a, a disc or a gate or a, a plug that is used in order to um, close off and isolate a valve. Because there are so many different terms used depending upon the valve type for this component, then the standards world tends to use the, the word obturator. And you'll see that used several times during the slides. But the dictionary definition of an obturator is something that closes or blocks up an opening. So let's take a look now at the, uh, the scope of the valve types we're gonna cover in this short course. There are five basic types and they're classified by the direction of motion of the obturator, but also by the direction of flow in the seating area. So the first uh, motion classification is linear motion. 
And in that category, we have gate, globe, and diaphragm valves, which we'll discuss. Second category being rotary motion involves plug and ball and butterfly valves. So starting with uh, linear obturator motion valves, the first type we'll look at is gate valves. Now the gate valve has a, a motion that is at 90 degrees to the direction of the flow, which is it, it's its first most important characteristic you can see on the diagram there. The obturator also in a gate valve moves the complete distance of the seat bore, which we term D. So the stroke of a gate valve is one of the longest strokes of any valve. And that is the full size of the ball, so uh, a stroke of D. That results uh, in a very large open area, and so a very low pressure drop, very little resistance to flow. And so the valve also, uh, the gate valve also is characterized by having a high flow coefficient or a high CV. The major disadvantage of a gate valve, though, is that the obturator maintains sliding contact with the seats all the way through the stroke. And so over a period of time, this can cause wear to the seat and disc surfaces, which could potentially cause leakage if the valve isn't correctly maintained. The second linear obturation, obturator motion valve is the globe valve. Uh, the globe valve has motion that is parallel to the direction of the flow, as opposed to the, uh, the gate valve. And then also the obturator on a globe valve only moves a distance of D over four. So it's a quarter of the stroke of a gate valve. The obturator also, as soon as it starts moving, immediately moves away from the seat. So there aren't the same issues of sliding wear that exist with a gate valve. However, the major disadvantage of a globe valve in comparison to a gate is that it has a very high pressure drop because the flow actually turns through two 90 degree angles as it moves through the valve, and this results in relatively low uh, flow coefficients when compared to a gate valve. And the third linear motion valve that we're going to look at uh, is really completely different in the way that it uh, controls fluid flow, and that's a diaphragm or pinch valve, because the flow passage in a diaphragm valve is changed by deformation of a flexible obturator. So instead of having a solid plug or disc controlling the flow, the diaphragm valve actually has a flexible uh, device um, to shut off or control the area within the flow orifice. It still has a linear obturator motion, but the, uh, the diaphragm or membrane deforms to uh, control the flow. The advantage of this is that the operating mechanism is located outside of the membrane so the operating mechanism itself is not wetted it's not in contact with the process fluid and it doesn't require a stem seal in order to seal the um, the stem from the, the process fluid that's important because uh, um, the stem seal is one of the major areas of leakage or requirements for maintenance in a valve and um, so diaphragm valves are widely used where um, leakage yeah, it's going to be a big problem in operation. The disadvantage with the diaphragm valve, however, is that uh, the use of this flexible membrane, which is typically some form of elastomer, has a very limited pressure and temperature rating. So that means diaphragm valves tend to be used only on lower pressure applications and also uh, over a limited temperature range that's usually pretty close to ambient. So if we move on now to look at rotary valve types, then the obturator rotates in, in rotary valve types through 90 degrees typically. And the first type we'll look at is a plug or ball valve. And in a ball valve, the flow passes through the obturator. So when the valve is open, it literally passes straight through the middle of the ball. Um, there is only a 90 degree uh, angle of movement required to operate to open or close a ball valve so it's very simple and quick to operate and this large open flow passage obviously gives uh, a low pressure drop when the valve is fully open and results in a high flow coefficient ball valves are used in, across a whole range of sizes but the larger sizes of ball valve 
do tend to suffer from higher operating torques because of friction between the seat and the ball. And the final type of uh, valve that we'll talk about now is another rotary valve and uh, uh, called the butterfly valve. And the butterfly valve flow actually passes around the obturator. So not through it like in the ball valve, but around it, around the vein. Um, like the, the ball valve, the butterfly valve has a 90 degree operation to open and close. But because of the uh, flow moving around the obturator, then um, butterfly valves tend to be used in larger sizes. The smallest practical butterfly valve is generally seen as uh, a DM50 valve or a two inch ball valve. Uh, anything smaller than that and the area available to flow around the vein starts to become very restricted. Um, the large sizes um, of butterfly valves suffer in a similar way to the ball valve in requiring very high operating torques. So if we move on now from looking at uh, different types of valves, to briefly looking at some of the materials used in their construction. This uh, table shows um, five materials that are commonly, metallic materials that are commonly used in uh, valve construction. The first two that you can see are both steels. So therefore they both have uh, iron, Fe as you can see in the table there is the main element that they contain. Now low alloy steels, which is the first category, have small amounts of other elements that are alloyed with the iron in, and the effect of these elements is to significantly change the properties of the steel. So they use um, low alloy steels use things like carbon, manganese, chrome, nickel or molybdenum in quite small quantities um, to alter the properties of the steel, generally to increase the strength um, of the steel but also to increase uh, the range of temperature performance at high or at low temperature. Stainless steels were developed, as the name suggests, originally to increase the corrosion resistance of steel and uh, allow it to be used with a wider range of fluids. You can see from the table that the alloyed elements for stainless steel are very similar to those used for low alloy steels, but they are generally used in larger quantities. So typically uh, a chromium uh, the chromium percentage in a uh, typical stainless steel could vary from 18 to 25 percent, um, making it a, a significant part of the steel itself and also influencing the cost of production of the steel. The third category that we look at on the table is that of copper alloys. The main element in a copper alloy is obviously copper, but um, copper, copper alloys are more corrosion resistant generally than steels. And they are also the oldest material that's been uh, used in the construction of valves. So uh, the, the um, Roman valve that we saw on one of the previous slides was uh, manufactured in bronze. And bronze is a, a copper alloy typically used, but so is brass. And also um, aluminium bronze and gunmetal are also typically used as copper alloys for the supply of valves today. Uh, the heating and ventilation industry, which is generally a relatively low pressure application for valves, is one of the chief areas that still uses um, copper alloy uh, as a uh, metallic um, element for, uh, for their products. And if we carry on moving uh, upwards in terms of uh, corrosion resistance, the most corrosion resistant alloys that are typically used in valve manufacture are, today are nickel alloys. Um, often they're known by their trade names, so uh, names such as uh, Inconel 625 or 718 or even Hastelloy C. They are all nickel alloys that offer extremely high levels of corrosion resistance, but because of the cost involved in producing them, they tend to be used for only specialised applications. And the final category that I want to talk about uh, on this slide is cobalt alloys. Cobalt alloys are, uh, again, often referred to by their trade name, um, which is usually stellite. And um, cobalt alloys in valves are usually deposited by welding as a uh, hard protective surface onto uh, components that may be uh, manufactured in low alloy steel or even stainless steel. The reason that um, we use stellites is to provide a hard facing to resist some of the erosive or corrosive forces that uh, exist within the fluid to prolong the, the um, 
life of the components and give them better leakage performance and resistance to wear. So let's on this slide look uh, in a little bit more detail at the uh, material, um, four typical steel materials that are used in uh, for our body construction. The first one is ferritic steel. And you can see from the uh, diagram on the right hand side there that ferritic steel has a, a body centered cubic atomic structure. So that means there's a, an atom at each corner of uh, a cube and also one in the center. And uh, ferritic steels um, are able to change their mechanical properties quite considerably by uh, how they are the method by which they're heat treated. The second part, uh, type of steel that uh, I'll mention is uh, austenitic steel. Now the austenitic steel structure, again, as you can see from on the, uh, the diagram on the right, is a face-centered cubic structure. And uh, it, this face-centered structure means that there are more atoms packed into the, uh, the lattice um, than uh, you would see with the ferritic steel. And this results in quite different um, properties uh, for austenitic steels. Uh, and heat treatment of austenitic steels generally controls the corrosion resistance of that particular steel. The third group that we'll look at is martensitic steels. And martensitic steels are made by taking a, uh, uh, an austenitic structure and rapidly cooling or quenching it. And uh, this results in a ferritic structure, but a distorted one. And uh, martensitic steels are, char are uh, characterized by their extremely high hardness and strength. Uh, for that reason, they tend to be used uh, mainly in internal components within valves and uh, um, parts that need very high strength, such as valve stems, are often produced in martensitic steel. Now, the final group that we'll look at is duplex stainless steel. Now, duplex stainless steel is the most recently developed steel uh, of the four that are shown on this slide. It was probably uh, first developed and started being readily used around about 40 years ago now. and um, uh, it's called duplex stainless steel because it is a mixture of ferritic and austenitic steel. In, um, so the aim of that is to uh, make use of the high strength properties that we get from ferritic steel, but also to mix them with a, a very good level of corrosion resistance that's more appropriate to uh, austenitic steel. Uh, duplex steels, in, um, particularly in the offshore oil and gas industry, have been very successful and they are widely now widely used in um, uh, corrosive uh, offshore applications. So if we now take the opportunity to look at um, uh, body, bonnet and cover materials in a little bit more detail from a designer's point of view, it's uh, essential when selecting the right material to obviously ensure that uh, the material has the strength needed, not only to cope with the pressure and temperature requirements, but also to cope with the uh, mechanical loads that are exerted by the valve and actuation mechanism and also by the system pipe work. Corrosion resistance of the material is obviously needs to be considered carefully and it needs to be compatible with the uh, line fluid that's going to be used. But we also need to consider how we're going to form this body bonnet or cover and take that into um, account when selecting or designing the manufacturing, selecting the material or designing the manufacturing methods. Castings uh, are often used to produce valve bodies or bonnets because the geometry that we need is obviously quite complex. Now castings uh, also always contain a small level of defect that is uh, inherent in the way that they're produced. And so it's very important from a designer's point of view when selecting the material and also, also the method of manufacture that they consider how easy it will be to produce the casting and what level of defects are acceptable in order to prevent shell leakage from occurring. So on this slide, we um, summarize the um, basis for selection of body bonnet and cover materials in terms of uh, the correct material to suit the fluid that's be, that uh, the valve application requires and also the design temperature and pressure two of the characteristics, but one of the other main selection criteria that is used is the cost. And you can see on the table on the right hand side, 
um, we have a list of materials there with increasing cost. But cast iron is a material that has been used for primarily for low pressure, relatively low corrosion applications for many years. And it is quite a basic material with relatively low cost. It's used for low pressure industrial valves. Carbon steel and low alloy steel, as we've discussed, provide higher levels of strength and, uh, and can be used for higher um, pr pressures and temperatures. And uh, they have a, an increasing, increased level of cost over cast iron. And they really can be considered to be the workhorse materials of the valve industry. The vast majority of valves, industrial valves produced use carbon steel or low alloy steel in their body and bonnet construction. Stainless steels and copper alloys, as we mentioned previously, are higher in cost because of the, the uh, cost of their, their basic elements. And they tend to be used where corrosion resistance or in some cases temperature performance um, mean that uh, it's appropriate to use those alloys. But the higher cost alloys that are used in valve body and bonnet manufacture in the modern world are nickel alloys, which uh, tend to be used on extremely corrosion, uh, corrosive applications. And so they are also extremely expensive to produce. So that they're used only when necessary. But probably the most expensive alloy that is used um, today is titanium alloy used for valve bodies. Now the aerospace industry obviously widely uses titanium as well for its uh, great strength and low weight. Those uh, properties are of interest to the valve designer, but the primary reason why titanium is used in valve bodies is for corrosion resistance. Uh, titanium alloys are, are widely used for um, offshore seawater application valves in uh, higher ambient conditions, but it should be recognized when I say they're expensive, that it's not unusual for titanium bodied valves to cost uh, in excess of 100,000 pounds if they're of large size. So. They really are only used when it's absolutely necessary. So moving away from metallic materials now and into uh, thermoplastic uh, polymers, let's look at materials that are commonly used in valve seats. PTFE is the most commonly used material and uh, that is because it's inert to most fluids. Uh, it has a low coefficient of friction, so good sliding um, of wear and uh, it is re a resilient material, so um, the seat faces achieve, uh, can easily achieve a bubble tight isolation with relatively low sealing forces. Pure PTFE uh, has a maximum service temperature of around about 230 degrees C, or possibly slightly less if it's more highly loaded. And uh, filled PT PTFE is also used. Um, that typically uh, utilizes carbon, graphite, or glass fillers to reinforce the PTFE, and uh, that can uh, generally have a service temperature of up to 260 degrees C and can withstand higher loadings. For higher temperature use then uh, and high loading use, then peak has been adopted as a, a good material, and that can be used at up to 280 degrees C. If we want to consider uh, applications that are lower uh, for lower temperatures, and those below minus 50 degrees C in particular, then pure PTFE tends to lose its resilience. It becomes very hard, doesn't have the same level of sealing performance at these low temperatures. And so uh, valve manufacturers tend to use uh, compounds such as ETFE for improved resilience and service at those low temperatures below minus 50 degrees C. Moving on now to look at uh, materials used in gaskets and packings. Now it's important to use resilient materials for these components because they always have to accommodate movement of the uh, metallic components that they're sealing against. When we look at gaskets then uh, the overwhelming uh, majority of gaskets used in uh, modern valves are 98% pure graphite sheets with stainless steel reinforcement. These are typically known as uh, spiral wound gaskets and um, they, they are uh, used in a massive variety of applications. For more specialized uh, uses, then uh, rubber gaskets are used um, and often they have a glass fiber uh, embedded in that rubber matrix to improve the strength properties of the material. And for even more specialized, K2 
chemically inert uh, uses, then uh, PTFE reinforced with ceramic is also used as a gasket material. If we start looking at packings, um, then the, the most popular packing material is again PTFE, which can be used with or without fillers to seal between the stem and the valve bonnet. But for typically for higher temperature applications, then graphite is nowadays widely used as a stem packing material. Uh, and this is used as a square section or uh, as chevron rings. Um, in applications where stem seal leakage is quite critical and fugitive emissions uh, are an issue, then um, braided rope packings have started to become widely used because they have very good sealing properties and they also uh, um, require very little maintenance over quite long periods of time. These braided packings typically uh, also use graphite uh, or perhaps glass fiber or PTFE reinforcement in order to achieve their uh, sealing performance. So I'd just like to summarize what we've been through today. Um, we've looked at five basic valve types um, split up into three linear motion types, such as gate, globe, and the diaphragm valve, recognizing that the gate valve is the longest travel, but uh, um, lowest pressure drop valve in that category. And also that the diaphragm valve um, is unusual in that uh, it, it doesn't have any um, uh, stem seal at all. And uh, the diaphragm is the obturator that creates the seal. Rotary motion valves, we've looked at the, um, the ball valve and also the butterfly valve. And we've taken a brief look at valve materials, those using the pressure envelope of the valves and also some materials used to uh, create polymeric seats and valve packings. So with um, this very brief introduction uh, to, to some of the uh, technologies used in valve manufacturer has interested you, as uh, Robert said at the beginning, if you want to learn some more, then um, the BBA have start, are starting to uh, offer their uh, Introduction to Valves course as an online training course. And we're starting to enroll for that course now. Um, it's an introductory course that is aimed at um, sales, procurement and technical staff uh, who are either new to the industry or maybe are changing roles and require a broader understanding of general valve technology. Um, the course is roughly a six hour course in terms of its uh, learnt content and some of the slides that you've seen today come from the full length course itself. Um, it will be delivered in four online sessions, somewhere around about 90 minutes each in terms of the talk content. And they will that will be run over uh, a two week period, so two sessions each week. If you're interested in uh, participating in this course and, uh, uh, and, and learning more, then um, Further details are available if you contact the BBAA on the uh, inquiry email you can see on the slide there. The BBA uh, are uh, also continuing to offer uh, training courses face-to-face uh, -face at our HQ in, in Banbury. And as Rob has said, there are some October dates available now for uh, some of the more specialized courses, such as introduction to valve actuators, control valves and safety valves, or in-depth courses on the PED and ATEX directive. We also offer a more uh, advanced level uh, valve course that covers um, uh, much more detail on, uh, on the various valve types. If you're interested in these these face-to-face -face courses, then please take a look at the BBAA website uh, at the usual address. Finally, I would like to thank uh, all of the BBAA members who uh, have supplied the invaluable images and some of the information that we've used in these slides. And uh, if you would like uh, to, uh, to uh, have a look in more detail at some of this information and have a reference uh, manual to keep on the shelf, then the BBAA produce a valve and actuator user manual, which we're actually in the process of updating at the moment. And uh, please contact uh, the BBAA for further details of that if you think you would find it useful. So, um, at that point, I'd just like to um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, hopefully, if uh, Rob's still uh, on the line, then uh, he'll be able to advise us if we have any questions. I, I think I managed to answer most of them for you, Peter. Um, 
there's some very good ones in there but then and a bit of selling going on as well i like it that's well done very nice ladies too um there's a an interesting point in here about um will the course explore total cost of ownership and sustainability uh, i think we're going to cover some of that in our uh, manual aren't we peter but um and and the other issue there was how can in canal valve or cobalt containing valves be reconditioned and or disposed of ethically that's something we covered in march i think at our uh, technical meeting but i don't know if you want to comment on either of those um i'm sorry could you repeat what the first question was rob yeah would will our course explore the total cost of ownership and sustainability um yeah, we, we um, throughout the introduction to valve course, as, as you've seen on these slides, then um, uh, we cover some of the cost elements that build up the purchasing cost or the um, selection of a particular valve type. Um, so that, that is covered to some degree. Uh, and we also refer a, a little bit to maintenance costs and some of the problems that can be that can occur when uh, um, th the appropriate solution isn't used. Um, so, yeah. so it's covered, but it's not covered as a specific subject. It's it's effectively embedded in most of the material one way or another. Okay, and we do have chapters on maintenance and so on in the manual, don't we? Yeah, yes, certainly the um, the user manual uh, um, covers that more specifically. Very good. Now, I don't know if anybody else is uh, frantically trying to thrash away a question in the uh, chat. I can't see any, Peter. Uh, so no, I've, yeah. I've just seen one um, question uh, briefly from uh, Maurizio, um, yeah. and, Maurizio and he's um, commenting that uh, we'd uh, we'd mentioned the PED and the ATEX directives uh, as um, training future training topics but what about the machineries directive which is currently in in revision um, well I think I, I should have correctly said that uh, the machineries directive is briefly mentioned in the uh, the PED uh, in the BBAA directives course, um, but uh, because previously it has been quite a static directive in terms of its requirements on valve manufacturers, then we haven't tended to specialise in it. But it, it is worthwhile um, recognising that that may be something that will change once the uh, directive has been fully, the machinery's directive has been revised in the future. Mm. As you say, I, I think that comes at the end of that PDA text course as a small session, doesn't it? Um, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, fairly settled that. I don't think we've. Um, I, I think it's a nice extra to that course, which is principally about the PED, I suppose. Um, but uh, the other one that's missing off there actually is safety integrity levels. We do a course on that as well, um, so that's worth uh, reminding folk about. Yeah. Uh, so there we go. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Maurizio. Well spotted as always. <laughs> Right, I'm just looking down. Lots of thanks. Um, no more questions that I can see at the moment, Peter. So that's um, that's looking good. I mean, if if anybody is interested in looking at this further, do get in touch with us uh, through that inquiry at bbaa.org.uk uh, email address. Uh, we'll be sending out through our usual channels a uh, promotional leaflet for the full park course. Um, in terms of coverage, if you want to go to the BBAA website and click on the training tab, uh, it does list all of the courses that we run here on our normal sort of face-to-face uh, -face delivery. But the nice thing in there is that each course has got a short description about the content. So if you're not sure, even after this presentation, what you will cover, just pop up there, have a, have a look at the courses, click on uh, the summary, and it will give you a good idea about what we're going to talk about in that uh, full day. So there you go. Right, can't see any more questions coming, Peter. Again, still lots of thanks coming in. Thanks, Lincoln, Samuel, Kevin, Liam, John, guys, Jessica. Yeah, really good. Nice to have had you along. Uh, so I think we're done, Peter. It's uh, It's been really good to deliver this for you again. Uh, very much hope you'll join us for the full course. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your involvement in this. It's been great. And um, we'll say farewell. Thanks very much. And uh, stay safe out there. Yeah, take care. Bye bye. Yeah. And thank you everyone for your uh, attention and your comments. Uh, we appreciate it. Very good. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.